I remember being in the Pentagon just after 9-11 and President Bush came over. And I mean, the building smelled of smoke and jet fuel, smelled like fire, and it just hung in the air for days. He came over and gathered up everybody, very senior people, and he said, remember this. Remember this moment. Remember what's been done to you, to the Pentagon. You know, they came into our house. And so we were angry, and that fueled an ability to really make pretty dramatic changes. Prominent CEOs, leading economists, iconic investors, insights from the experts. The Walker Webcast with Willie Walker. See who's next. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to another Walker webcast. I uh, must say that today's guest, it is a true, true honor to have Admiral James Stavridis uh, join me for the Walker webcast. Um, let me do a quick bio on the Admiral and then we will dive into our conversation. Uh, Admiral James uh, Stavridis attended the U.S. Naval Academy and spent 37 years in the United States Navy, rising to the rank of four-star Admiral. Among his many commands were Supreme Allied Commander at NATO and U.S. Southern Command, charged with military operations throughout Latin America. In the course of his career, he served as Senior Military Assistant to the Secretary of the Navy and the Secretary of Defense. He led the Navy's premier operational think tank for innovation, Deep Blue, immediately after the 9-11 attacks. In 2016, he was vetted for vice president by Secretary Hillary Clinton and subsequently invited to Trump Tower to discuss a cabinet position with President Donald Trump. He earned a PhD from the Fletcher School at Tufts University, winning the Guyon Prize as outstanding student, and went on to be dean of the Fletcher School from 2013 to 2018. Jim has published eight books on leadership, the oceans, maritime affairs, and Latin America, as well as hundreds of articles in leading mm -hmm. journals. He is chairman of the Rockefeller Foundation, as well as chair of the board of the U.S. Naval Institute. He is a monthly columnist for Time Magazine and chief international security analysis for NBC News. Finally, Admiral Stavridis is vice chair, global affairs, and a managing director at the Carlisle Group. So, Jim, first, thank you so much for joining me on the Walker webcast. Um, it truly is an honor to have you uh, join me. I'm a huge fan of you, your career, your service to our country and your intellect. Uh, I know it will become apparent throughout our discussion today how well read you are, how thoughtful you are on all matters, and what an incredible leader you are during your active military service, as well as a, as a civilian. Um, our discussion today is gonna to cover a lot. I wanna start with what makes you the man and leader you are, and then I wanna to move to some insights from your active military service, then to a number of your books, and finally your insights on the world we live in today. Uh, so let's start with this. How about you retell the story about playing the number one squash player in the world when you were a student at the Naval Academy? <laughs> well, first of all, thanks for having me on, Willie. And um, we, we had a great conversation in Sun Valley last summer. And I know we'll pick up some of those uh, stories and push them along a little further. Um, I want to begin actually by saying congratulations to you on what you've done with your firm, it's, it's meteoric rise, um, everything you've done globally to be helpful and to sit on charitable boards and, um, and your own athletic career, which is uh, pretty significant in the worlds of uh, skiing and marathon running and, and a lot of other things. But you're nice to ask about uh, my squash career. I played varsity tennis and varsity squash at the Naval Academy in the uh, late 1970s. And so I was at the time number one on the squash team uh, and we were a nationally ranked team. We were in the top five in the country and I kind of floated between one, two and three depending on how things were going between my competitors. So our coach brought in for us to play a former world champion. He was a Pakistani guy. And he was probably at that point in his early 40s. So to us as midshipmen, he was at least 20 years older than we were. He looked kind of ancient. He had pot belly and kind of skinny legs um, and a former world number one. And, and so the coach said to him, well, 
Mr. Khan, he was one of the famous cons of, of squash, K-H-A-N. Uh, the coach said, what would you like to do? And he said, well, I'm happy to play everybody on the ladder. Okay, fine. So there are nine people on a varsity squash ladder. So he started by playing the number nine player, beat him 3-0, number eight, 3-0, number seven, 3-0, number et cetera. You get the idea. So I was the last guy, number one, who was going to play with this legendary player. Now, remember, he's now played eight hard squash matches. He's won them all 3-0. And, uh, you know, I thought, you know, gosh darn it, I, I, I'm probably not going to win a match with this guy, but I'm going to win a game. You know, I was pretty set. You know, I was a second team All-American. I thought, OK, you know, I can do this. This guy's got to be exhausted. We got into the court. And he turned to me and he said, would you mind if I smoked a cigarette while we played? <laughs> and, he, and he lit up a cigarette and beat me not only 3-0, he beat me pointless. I didn't win a single point. Now, that's, that's a lesson uh, that I received. And, and here's what I took away from it, Willie. And it's a good lesson for all of us, which is no matter how well you're doing, there's somebody better than you. It's, it's a lesson about humility. And it was a pretty good one. Um, I, I would only say, given your career, there aren't many better than you <laughs> in lots and lots of things. Um, let me let me jump to the summer of 73. Um, it's between your freshman and sophomore year at the Naval Academy. You've been assigned to a Navy destroyer for the summer and you're leaving the port of San Diego. Why do you know at that moment you were going to disappoint your dad? Yeah, because my father was a career officer in the U.S. Marine Corps, very proud infantry officer who had fought in World War II, Korea, Vietnam. And when I went off to the Naval Academy and for my entire first year, known as your plebe year, um, I was pretty dedicated to the idea of following my father and becoming an infantry officer in the U.S. Marine Corps. On that summer cruise, the summer after my freshman year, I walked up onto the bridge of that destroyer, Jewett, DLG-29. And as I walked onto the bridge, Willie, I looked out at a setting sun. We were getting underway uh, late in the day and the sun was just going down. I looked at that horizon and I saw all that light and all that water. And I was like St. Paul on the road to Damascus. You know, the scales dropped from before my eyes. And I realized... I wanted to be a sailor. I wanted to be at sea. I wanted to be a, a sea captain. And, uh, you know, I went home later that summer for my one month off that they give you. And I uh, broke the news to my dad, who at that point was a retired colonel in the Marine Corps. And he was not happy. Mm -hmm. And I would say he wasn't happy with that career choice uh, till about 25 years later when I pinned on my first star as a rear admiral. Then he finally said, you know, Jim, I guess that's turned out pretty well for you. Thanks, Dad. On that, that relationship with your dad, it sounds from having heard you tell that story that there was, a, if you will, some pretty hefty expectations placed on you and mm -hmm. a desire not to disappoint your father. Was that kind of to some degree the first time you disappointed your dad? Um, I, I probably had disappointed him in some small things uh, along the road of life. Um, I, I remember once being on the tennis court and, and losing a match and taking my tennis racket and breaking it, you know, putting it at an angle and stomping on it and breaking it in half in the days of uh, wooden tennis rackets. He was quite disappointed that day. And I learned a, a hard lesson about that. But uh, in terms of something that I think he really had a, a deep and prideful expectation that I would follow his footsteps entirely into the Marine Corps. Yeah, I think it was, uh, I think, I think it did hurt him. And again, he was one to always be supportive and ultimately it turned out pretty well for me. And I'm glad he was around to see that as well. You became a Russia expert and um, clearly there are many people today who forget about a, the Cold War, um, but B, the strength of the Russian Navy and um, how formidable a force they were during the early part of your career and when yeah. you first became an admiral. Talk for a moment about, if you will, the Russian Navy, 
back then and how important the Russian Navy is to Russia today? I'd be glad to. Um, and, you know, the first part of my career was the Cold War. You know, we did the, the last 20 years of my career was the last probably 10 to 15 years, I should say, was the global war on terror um, after 9-11. But the first part, the first uh, 20 years was the Cold War. And so I, I, I studied the Russian Navy. We all did. We could um, sit down with a piece of paper and sketch the profile of any Russian warship of the 50 different kinds they have and describe the missile systems, the propulsion capability, the navigational capability, the crew size. We could tell you everything about that. Cold War fleet, and they could do the same about us. And we conducted many, many uh, tabletop exercises, many uh, war games, uh, simulating Russian behaviors. And then finally, Willie, we spent a lot of time confronting them at sea. Um, our ships tracking their submarines, their long range bombers. I'll, I'll always remember as we would approach the Western Pacific, we'd see Russian long range naval bombers come out and target us. Um, it, it was a very confrontational relationship. We came to know them well. In those days, and now we're talking the 1980s, 1990s, before the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, they were a very formidable force, both in terms of numbers, in terms of capabilities. We saw them exercise. Um, they were dangerous. And the big advantage we had was our aircraft carriers. The Russians never made the deep investment necessary to build those magnificent machines of war. They're hard to build. You've got to train in a very different way. So we always had that whole card, if you will, to put it in a poker analogy. We knew that our carriers could maneuver, could surge forward, could attack their ships, whereas they had long range land bombers and they had missiles but nothing can substitute for the maneuverability, the size, the striking power of our carriers. So we worried a lot about them, uh, but I think if we had, God forbid, ended up in a hot war instead of a cold war, I think we would have more than held our own. Uh, I'll close on the Soviet Navy with a final observation, which is they were always deeply capable in undersea warfare. Their nuclear submarines, think Hunt for Red October, that's pretty real in terms of their technological capabilities. They weren't quite at our level, but they were pretty damn close as opposed to aircraft carriers where they had none and we had many. Their nuclear submarine force was very capable and would have given our submariners as good as they are a run for their money in the deep waters of the North Atlantic, for example. So that's a snapshot of the Soviet Navy. Flash forward from the end of the Soviet uh, era, roughly 1990, call it, to today, 30 years on. Today, the Russian Navy is a, a shadow of the Soviet Navy. It's uh, maybe a third uh, as good as that Soviet Navy. It still has no aircraft carriers. It still has reasonably good nuclear submarines, but they have fallen a generation behind ours in terms of submarine capability. And uh, I'll close with this, Willie. Pretty good example, the Black Sea Fleet operating in and around, of course, the coastline of Ukraine. Um, about four months ago, the flagship of the Black Sea Fleet, a Slava class cruiser, a ship that I studied and knew every, everything about, but think about it, a Cold War cruiser is the flagship of their fleet, and it was ignominiously sunk by a combination of drones and missiles, uh, very capably employed by the Ukrainians. Um, you know, the first thing they teach you at Annapolis, Willie, is don't get your flagship sunk. I think the, uh, the Russians are not what they used to be when they were the Soviet Navy. In the mid to late 1990s, you had a shot at Osama bin Laden. Uh, talk about the day that you launched Tomahawk missiles to try and get Osama bin Laden. Yeah, this was, uh, as you say, uh, late 90s. And um, uh, you may sort of vaguely recall there were some bombings of our embassies in East Africa 
um, killed uh, several hundred people, mostly locals from those two countries. Um, the president tasked the U.S. Navy to launch Tomahawk missiles against the terrorist who had perpetrated those attacks. Of course, it was Osama bin Laden, although none of us had really heard of him. He was kind of a boutique intelligence problem who suddenly jumped onto the radar of the United States of America. So we got the mission to launch a big bag of tomahawks, you know, kind of 80 to 120 in that range at a terrorist training camp where Osama bin Laden, according to our intelligence, um, had taken up residence uh, in South Asia. And so we put the strike together and those Tomahawk missiles, Willie, had to fly over Pakistan. So because they would appear on the Pakistani radars, we went to the Pakistanis. This was all done by State Department, high level military US and informed the Pakistanis about the strike literally a few moments before those missiles broke the Pakistani radar horizon. By all accounts, the Pakistanis warned bin Laden. We missed him from all that I have seen. We missed him by a few moments. So think how different history might have been if those tomahawks, which were dead on their target, um, had caught bin Laden. And as you and I talked about once before, the irony for me personally is that was 1998 and I was the leader in this Tomahawk strike, which almost killed bin Laden with long range missiles. In 2001, several years later, I was in the Pentagon as a newly selected one star rear admiral and Osama bin Laden returned fire. Um, I glimpsed the aircraft as it hit the Pentagon. I was maybe 150 feet off the impact point. And I'm only here talking to you because I was up on the fourth deck of the Pentagon. The aircraft struck the second deck going down, obviously. So I was spared that day. Uh, so he got his shot in against me. Um, ultimately, as we all know, um, he was sent to his greater rewards, so to speak, by Navy SEALs a few years later. So the Navy got, the, got, got that one in the end, I would say. So when you and I have discussed 9-11 before, um, you've said to me, it um, it sounded like a typical explosion. There, yeah. there are few of us who know what a typical explosion sounds like. Um, the other thing you said was that at when, when, the, when the plane crashed into the Pentagon, because all Navy men are trained firefighters, yeah. I, I think that's such an interesting concept for those of us who haven't been on a ship in the sense that, of course, fire on a ship is a very, I mean, fire anywhere is imminent danger, but on a ship, it's really important that you put it out very quickly. And so the concept that all the naval trained officers and enlisted men and women who were in the Pentagon that day are immediately going to the scene and trying to help put out the fire because that's what you're trained to do. Not that anyone who was trained in the, you know, who was in the army didn't want to help. But the point is, I just think that thought of all of you being trained firemen and women was an interesting one. But what fascinated me the most, Jim, about that is that here you are in arguably the most secure building on the face of the planet. And yet from your telling, that's as close as you ever came to getting killed during your military service. Indeed, it, absolutely. Here I was in the Pentagon, as you say correctly, the safest place in the world, right? Full stop. I mean, you're guarded by the strongest military on earth. You're in a massive concrete building with huge huge walls. You're in the capital of the richest country on the planet. And the irony of the moment is, no, I was not safe. That was in a, in a career with my fair share of combat where I came the closest to being eliminated. And, um, you know, back to the firefighting point, you know, if you think about it on a ship at sea, you've got to put out the fire. It's not like you can just like walk across the street and declare the building a loss and put a perimeter around it. You're at sea. So yeah, we're all trained. We do initial, very significant training. And then we all do a refresher course annually, every sailor. So yeah, we're pretty good at fighting fires. But that day 
we didn't have any tools. We didn't have the big hoses. We didn't have the, the big pumps. We didn't have all the uh, access equipment. We didn't have above all the, uh, the masks, the oxygen breathing apparatus that allow you to go into a fire. We didn't have all that. What we had was a few bulkhead mounted cylinder fire extinguishers, no good at all against that inferno. So we all stumbled out onto that grassy area outside the Pentagon and uh, up, up came the first responders, big heroes, true heroes. And they fought that fire like hell. And uh, yeah, I lost a lot of shipmates in there. Unfortunately, the, the plane killed a, a bunch of army folks because it hit the uh, personnel section of the army, but it hit the Navy Intelligence Center in the Pentagon. So I lost a, a number of great uh, shipmates, colleagues, friends who died in that. Uh, one in particular, I always remember um, Captain Bob Dolan, pretty senior officer was down there and got was killed. And uh, he was a surface line officer, a destroyer officer, knew him, knew his family. They lived in our neighborhood in Northern Virginia. And you think about that random walk, you know, I could easily have been in Bob's billet. He could easily have been up in mine. Um, he was a remarkable guy, quoted Shakespeare constantly. Oh, uh, that made him, that, given how much you read and how much you quote yeah. both literature and, and novels oh, yeah. and things of that nature, I'm sure that, I that him. endeared him to you immediately. Yeah, and last, last thought on that uh, for listeners, if, if when you take that trip to Washington that everybody does and you see the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Monument, the 9-11 um, Memorial at the Pentagon, go and see that. It, it's got a bench there for everybody who died, both on the plane and in the Pentagon. It's a beautiful, serene place. Um, you don't need a particular clearance to go. You can just go and there's parking right there, right by the Pentagon. Go see that. It's, it's very moving. How much, Jim, did that, if you will, the paradox of being in the world's most secure building and yet coming as close to death as you ever have, having been in a position of danger so many times throughout your career, how did that influence you going forward from that moment? In other words, I mean, I would think that we all think, okay, this is going to be a tough time in the business world, for instance, batten down the hatches, focus on the problem, and we're all kind of focused on it. But typically in life, the things that really impact us are the things that surprise us, not the things that we can see coming. And if you think about it in your career, that was a really big surprise that the closest you came was being in such a safe environment. Has that impacted the way you've thought about management leading your life subsequently? It has. And it, it drove home uh, two enormously important things. One is that uh, your life can change forever in an instant. And think of me and Captain Bob Dolan and uh, the 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 knowledge that it's very real, it can completely uh, change it is very profoundly important. And, and my most recent book is called To Risk It All. And it's it's about that, about those moments when we are challenged and we have to uh, make very hard choices under immense pressure. So that was one big lesson for me. And, and the second one was um, you've got to be ready to respond in a crisis. In other words, the, the first point is it can really happen. And the second point is be ready to change fundamentally how you're doing business. And I'll give you the practical example. The U.S. Navy pre-9-11 was still out there kind of acting like the Cold War was still going on. We were deploying these big carrier battle groups. We were um, talking about the Russian Navy, even though they had little capability, talking about the Chinese Navy. You know, we were kind of trying to just keep doing the same thing. You know, never underestimate the ability of a human being to think that tomorrow is going to be a lot like today, except maybe just a little bit different. But when things really change, like 9-11, you got to change what you're doing. And for us in the Navy, uh, we realized we were going to be part of this global war on terror. And that meant a very different basket of capabilities from uh, being more mindful of being on land, sending sailors ashore, getting the SEALs in there, getting our explosive ordnance detachments in there, getting our carriers pushed up 
to the edges of these nations, Iraq, Afghanistan, the Horn of Africa, launching precision strikes in very undeveloped areas. It was a, a huge new raft of things we had to do. And I'll close with this, Willie. Um, right after the explosion, right after 9-11, the chief of naval operations uh, asked me to, to create, a, if you will, a tactical war fighting think tank. It was called Deep Blue. He said, pick 15 people, anybody you want in the Navy, King's Cross, go get anybody. And I gathered who I thought were maybe the smartest dozen people in the Navy from all ranks, from lieutenant to senior captain. And including Bill McRaven. Including Bill McRaven, very good. Um, including Kurt Tidd, who went on to a four-star admiralship. Um, and, and two of those lieutenants are about to make rear admiral. They'll be the trailing edge of that group. Pretty remarkable group of folks. Um, and believe me, we were focused on what are the new things we have to do. And I did that for about a year and a half. And then the Chief of Naval Operations released me to go be a carrier strike commander, which was my heart's desire at that moment. Talk about that for a moment, though, Jim, because mm. I find that that task, if you will, of saying we've been fighting exactly as you just outlined it. We've been fighting this war. We've been putting our resources towards this enemy. And all of a sudden, you're given basically a blank sheet of paper to say, rethink the way we're doing everything. And yeah. given the size and scale of the Navy, <laughs> I get it that you had 15 super, super smart people helping you think about this. But it's almost like being on a, on a McKinsey team that sits there and says, OK, we've got to rethink everything. And, and in the United States Navy, that's not, I mean, you might come up with some great idea, but let's use the analogy, it's an aircraft carrier. You can't just kind of turn it on a dime. So as you sat there for a year and a half and rethought the challenges that presented you, you were also faced with the reality of how can we actually mobilize or make real change in the U.S. Navy. As, as, as you think back on that process, what was the what was the biggest inhibit, inhibitor, if you will, as it relates to, okay, we thought we needed to do this, but we knew we could only do this because of just kind of history and 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 momentum and kind of the way that things were established. I think you need to, we all need to put ourselves back in the mindset of the days and months right after 9-11. Um, first and foremost, we were angry. We were deeply angry. I remember being in the Pentagon just after 9-11 and President Bush came over. And I mean, the building smelled of smoke and jet fuel, smelled like fire, and it just hung in the air for days. He came over and gathered up everybody, very senior people, and he said, remember this. Remember this moment. Remember what's been done to you, to the Pentagon. You know, they came into our house. And so we were angry and that fueled an ability to really make pretty dramatic changes. Uh, number two, we had a visionary chief of naval operations, a four-star admiral named Vern Clark. And he really gave the whole Navy the chance to, to build in these ideas and try new things. And three times a week, he would gather his most senior admirals and Deep Blue would come in and brief and say, okay, here's an idea. Here's another idea. And the admirals would kind of tear it apart. And just like all innovation, and you know this from, from running your firm, everybody's well aware in the business world, you know, innovation is important, but it's like baseball in terms of batting average. If you're hitting one in four, that's a pretty solid season. One in three, that's you're headed to all-star league. Um, it, it, you don't expect anybody to take on all these ideas, but we had a lot of top cover from the chief of naval operations. So that was number two. And, and I think number three, and to your point, what held us back and where could we not really close the switch? And frankly, it was parochialism on the part of individual communities within the Navy. What I mean by that is the aircraft carrier folks wanted 
all the resources to go to carriers so that the carriers could come in close, littoral warfare, launch the strikes. The surface warfare folks like me, the destroyers, the cruisers, they wanted the money for long range strikes, Tomahawk missiles, um, all the things that their community could do. The submariners were kind of in shock because really they had the hardest task as a community. How are they going to impact um, Afghanistan? How are they going to impact Iraq? There's no submarine force for them to fight. So they're thinking about the SEALs and putting them in submarines and moving them ashore. And you mentioned Bill McRaven. Um, of course, he was the, the queen of the ball. The SEALs were suddenly the the had the ultimate cachet of anybody. Um, and so they had ideas. So in terms of distributing those resources, each of these communities were competing. And our job at Deep Blue was to kind of suggest ways to go and where to distribute those resources. And I'll close with this. Um, you know, it kind of became, hey, Stavridis, um, you better be careful you know, your career could be at risk here. And in fact, I had one very senior aircraft admiral say to me, Stavridis, your career is over after this. Because I was advocating, you know, okay. shifting those resources toward the SEALs, toward EOD, toward uh, long range strike by surface. Um, and the carrier guys were not happy with me. And uh, again, top cover. Uh, Admiral Clark made sure I got out of there and got to my strike group. But um, like any bureaucracy, the Navy will dig in, have pockets of resistance, parochialism. You have to break through those. A crisis is a pretty good time to do that. There was an interesting article this weekend in the Wall Street Journal about the head of U.S. CENTCOM, uh, Michael Carrilla, doing uh, what I guess in the out to the outside world will be something analogous to Shark Tank, where he he created something called Innovation Oasis to mm -hmm. sort of look from the bottom up yeah. and get really great ideas. And the article highlighted this young 24-year-old sergeant who had created this drone tracking technology on his laptop and uh, that he was brought in and kind of won the Shark Tank competition. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was so fascinating to think about just the structure of the US military and how it is so you know yeah. established and and the ability to change things just back to what you were just talking about and just kind of fun that the the the, the general Carilla is actually thinking about sort of if you will flipping that on its head yeah and it's something um i have done um i didn't have the benefit of watching the show shark tank <laughs> but for example when i was a captain in command of a uh eight destroyers I would challenge each of the ships, hey, come up with one big idea and bring it forward. And we'll see which ones we can find resources to support. So it's kind of the same concept. I'll give you two other ideas on innovation. And by the way, that obviously has applicability to any, any business at almost any scale. Challenge the workforce and then incentivize and reward those who come forward. Number two, just like um, the idea of putting deep blue reporting directly to the top of the Navy, a pretty good idea, I think, in any business is to have a small, if you will, think tank, and we call it an innovation cell, small number of people, smart switched on people who can kind of energize different parts of the bureaucracy. Um, that's another pretty good idea. And everywhere I went at every level, I had a innovation cell with, you know, kind of three to five people who are dedicated to finding the new. And then third and finally, it's when you find those people like that 24-year-old sergeant or that 29-year-old uh, lieutenant who comes up with a new way to use radar, reward them and uh, put it in their fitness reports and groom their next billet using mentorship um, to elevate those can help you change the culture to one that really focuses on innovation. Those are three important things. Jim, as you think about transitioning to the Southern Command, and um, as I look back, having lived in Latin America for almost a decade, when I lived there in the 1990s, mm -hmm. the U.S. influence in countries like Argentina, Brazil, and Paraguay, where I lived for a period of time, 
seemed unlimited. We had huge influence on the region. All eyes were focused on the United States of America and um, the U.S. ambassador and U.S. military operations in those countries was very clearly leading the world. Um, 9-11 happens and we make a shift in the war on terror to, from my read of it, essentially not forgetting about all of Latin America, but really moving our shift because of terrorism and because of the war on not only terrorism, but then the connection into the world, the, the war on drugs, all of our focus went on Colombia. And over the last two decades, Colombia has been really our beachhead, if you will, in Latin America. And to some degree, we've opened up for countries like China to come in and replace the United States yeah. as it relates to our influence in the region. As you think back on that and having run Southern Command, um, should we have kept more of a broad influence in Latin America or was the shift to Colombia and the war on terror necessary and actually to, from an insider's perspective, not an outsider's perspective like me, the right thing to have done? Um, let, let's begin with a proposition. In my view, we are, we, the United States of America, are deeply underweight in paying attention to what's happening in the world to the South, in the Americas, um, enormous potential. And by the way, they haven't had a significant war there uh, for decades. Um, they are a big population, huge natural resources. Today, they're almost all democracies. We don't love every single government that gets elected, but um, they have made that jump shift to real democracy, essentially throughout the region, the exceptions being Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua. Those would be the three that are outliers at the moment. Here's the point. Generally speaking, we ought to be paying a lot more attention because the potential there is enormous economically, culturally, demographically, natural resources, all the above. In terms of the focus we put on Colombia, I think it was a necessary element of the larger global war on terror. But remember this about Colombia, there were never more than a thousand US troops there ever. And partly that's because there was a congressional cap on it. Number two, we engaged Colombia using something called Plan Colombia, which was generated bipartisan by both sides of the political divide. And it really was a classic example of a little bit of hard power, you know, CIA, some precision guided weapons, thousand troops, but really the big thrust of it was economic. I, I would argue it's been fairly successful. Um, we finally got rid of the FARC. There was a negotiation that concluded it. Overall, it was a major effort, but our failing, you're exactly right, Willie, was just taking our eyes off the rest of the region China has stolen a step on us there with their Belt and Road Initiative. We ought to pay a lot more attention. And I'll close with this because you and I are both Spanish speakers. Today in America, 15% uh, of us speak Spanish as a first or a very strong second language, 15%. We're actually the second largest Spanish speaking country in the world after only Mexico. By mid-century, 30% of Americans will speak Spanish as a first or a strong second language. We're well on our way to being a bilingual, bicultural country. And that will help us over time with this world to the South where we ought to be paying more attention. So you went on to be <laughs> Supreme Allied Commander of NATO. Um, first of all, I don't think there's a better job title in the world. Uh, <laughs> may, maybe King, maybe, but Supreme Allied Commander is pretty, pretty great. Um, for a moment, Jim, when you ran NATO, there were 28 members that was expanded to 30. And we're now on the on the precipice of having two more members to make it 32. Um, talk about the importance of Finland and Sweden potentially sure. joining NATO. It's huge. Um, and I'll give you a, a basket of reasons. First of all, um, these are turnkey militaries. They are ready to snap in. They've already been operating with us for several decades. I commanded Finns and Swedes, not only in Afghanistan, but in the Balkans on counter piracy missions. The Swedes were part of the war over Libya. These are, again, ready turnkey militaries. The Swedes make 
an extraordinary combat air fighter, the Gripen, which is the certainly the equal of the Hornet. Um, the Finns, on the other hand, highly capable land army. I mean, they only have a population of 5 million, but I guarantee you in three weeks, they could put 500,000 well-trained, well-equipped, highly motivated soldiers in the field. They have more artillery pieces than any other country in Western Europe. And the reason is they sit right on that border with Russia. They were invaded by the Soviet Union in 1939. They fought them to a standstill in the Winter War, which looks a fair amount like what we're seeing in Ukraine, by the way. So first point, two turnkey militaries. Second point, geography. This complicates Vladimir Putin's life enormously. That distant boom you hear is his head exploding when he hears that Finland and Sweden are part of NATO because it means that's another 800 miles of border up on his upper left-hand flank that he's got to protect in some way, except his army is getting broken on the wheel of Ukraine thousand miles to the south. So huge geographic complication. Third point, the Arctic. Both Finland and Sweden are significant Arctic nations. They have territory up there. They will be a formidable part of the additional five NATO nations that are part of that Arctic suite up there. Um, again, that gives us leverage and engagement. And then fourth, and maybe most importantly, them joining is psychologically so significant. These are two nations that historically have been neutrals, have been very carefully guarded their neutrality, kind of like the Swiss have. And by the way, even the Swiss, and this staggers me, but even the Swiss are starting to have a conversation about potentially joining NATO. So psychologically for Europe as a whole to see these two very important, high-tech, capable militaries, geographically prime position say, yeah, I want that NATO membership card. That's a powerful moment for the Alliance. They are most welcome. Talk for a moment about, I've heard you say that you think that Putin's burn rate right now in both the cost as well as troop losses is unsustainable and that you think he might be coming to the table potentially as early as by the end of the year. That obviously, when I heard you say that, I said that has massive implications, not only from a geopolitical standpoint, that has massive implications from the economy. I, as we sit here today and watch the stock market bounce all over the place, and we look yeah. at interest rates going and what the Fed's trying to do to tame uh, inflation, the one sort of silver bullet that I can see out there is if Vladimir Putin was no longer either running Russia or this conflict ceased. So give a little bit of insight about sort of your conviction that his burn rate is unsustainable and when that sort of forces his hand? Yeah, I think there are two burn rates, you know, private equity alert. I'm vice chairman at the Carlisle Group. We talk about burn rates a lot in our portfolio companies. A burn rate is just the resources that you're kind of clipping through, but it, it exists on both sides of that firing line. So Putin's burn rate is troops. He's probably lost north of 30,000 killed in action maybe 60,000 grievously wounded. He's trying to backfill by a, a, a shambolic recruiting process, but he's burning through troops and he's burning through equipment. Think about this. Putin is now on bended knee going to Tehran and asking for Iranian drones, Iranian long-range missiles. That's pretty extraordinary that a military that's supposedly one of the best in the world is running out of its own resources in that regard. So, uh, and by the way, he's lost, I don't know, 2,000 tanks and armored personnel carriers as a percentage of his force, probably 40% in those categories. Um, dozens and dozens of combat aircraft, high burn rate, men and material. Over here, there's a subtle difference. The Ukrainians have high motivation. They're getting backfilled with all the equipment they need. Their problem, their burn rate is the patience and the checkbook of the West. And even in the last few days, we've heard from Speaker Potential McCarthy saying, you know, those blank checks we've been writing, maybe that's not going to keep going at that level. You know, he didn't say we're going to walk away from Ukraine. And I, I can't imagine he, he 
conceptualizes doing so. But I think he is channeling what a lot of people are thinking, that we're spending tens of billions of dollars over here, and it's it's going to have long-term costs. And so that burn rate of patience and resources is acting on Zelensky. So what the question is, when do both those burn rates kind of cross, like in Ghostbusters, except here you want those streams to cross. And I'd say it keeps getting pushed out by the success of the Ukrainians and by Putin's intransigence. But I think the reality is that by end of Q1, beginning Q2, which not coincidentally is after the winter, you're going to see both those burn rates kind of start to cross. That's the moment when we could think about a negotiation. What would that look like? You know, it could be uh, President Erdogan of Turkey, who did a pretty good job. I, when you and I were talking in the summer, great concerns about grain getting out of Ukraine. Erdogan stepped in and negotiated the agreement, which is working reasonably well, moving grain out of Odessa. Um, could Erdogan, who is known and trusted, I think, in both capitals, be a force? Maybe. How about Xi, President Xi? If there's anybody who would want the economy of the world to get back on a solid footing, it's President Xi. Um, you know, he just had his uh, coronation as the, the supreme leader. You know, maybe he'll become the supreme leader of China. Who knows? Uh, but I think more importantly, he had some small good news. His uh, growth looks like closer to 4% than 3%, but that's, hey, that's a recession in China. If you're not right. making six to eight, that's terrible. And I don't need to tell a real estate czar like you about the real estate overbuild problem China has. So he's got a lot of motivation to try and solve this problem. He might step in, could be the United Nations, the secretary general. In any event, to answer the question, I think those burn rates Willie will kind of come together, hopefully right after the winter. That's my best bet right now. So talking about Xi is a is a is a good segue to your book 2034, which many have called speculative fiction. Um, I would call it prescient fiction, uh, given what we're seeing right now going on in both Europe as well as in Asia. Yeah. Um, but one of the reasons I've heard you title it. 2034, Jim, is that by 2030, it's your estimation that China becomes the global superpower. And so given that you put it four years after China sort of takes that role, and given exactly what you just pointed to of China's growth being at three to 4% right now, their economic capability and the strength of China seems to be one of the preconditions to them going after Taiwan. Uh, and in your book, it's basically a conflict between the United States and China that is tipped off by a cyber attack, which happens around Taiwan. And as a result of that, then Russia goes and invades Poland, uh, which is all very interesting, given that in the reality now we have Russia invading Ukraine. Um, so that's the reason I call it prescient uh, 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 fiction. But talk for a moment about the real threat of China invading Taiwan or doing a blockade around Taiwan and whether you think right now we are closer to that reality or further away than what you portray in your book. Yeah, I think uh, here's some good news. I think we're actually further away. And the reason for that is um, quite clear. If you put yourself in the shoes of President Xi watching what's happening in Ukraine, you're asking yourself three questions. Number one, I wonder if my generals are as bad as those Russian generals appear to be. I wonder if my equipment is as crummy as the Russian equipment. And frankly, a lot of the model of the Chinese military is based on the old Soviet system. And don't forget, if you're President Xi, your army hasn't been in a war since 1950, since the Korean War. The United States, on the other hand, has been in the Vietnam War, Persian Gulf I, Persian Gulf II, Iraq, Afghanistan. The West has highly blooded armies. You do not. So you don't know. You just don't know how it will turn out if you go to the big dance with the United States. Question two you're asking yourself is, I wonder if those Taiwanese will fight like hell the way the Ukrainians are. 
answer. You don't know. I don't know. But I've been there. I've met with the Taiwanese. I've met Madam Tsai, the president. Um, I think the Taiwanese will fight and fight hard. I don't think they'll go gently into that good night. So that's uncertainty if you're Xi. And number three, you're asking yourself to our conversation a moment ago, you know, the most important thing for me is my economy. And, you know, my economy is too big to sanction, right? Well, who knows? Maybe we can't carpet bomb the Chinese economy with sanctions. We can certainly launch some very precision guided strikes. The recent chip concerns, I think, are a, an example of what could really hamstring the Chinese economy. So bottom line, if you're Xi, you're feeling pretty good. You've been anointed as the leader of China for a third five-year term, but you're watching this debacle in Ukraine uh, fomented by your strongest ally, by definition, I suppose. They're not, by the way, formal allies, but they have a partnership without limits, was how the two of them categorized it in January before the invasion. I think there are some limits now. So when I look at all of that, Willie, I think if you're Xi, you're kind of pumping the brakes here. You're not looking for a massive war with the United States. I think that gives Taiwan some breathing space. They can then purchase the weapon systems they need to defend themselves. Hopefully that'll create deterrence. And 2034 will turn out not to be predictive fiction, but cautionary fiction that led to some of the changes that help us avoid such a war. So um, I've heard you mention the book Strategy of Denial by Eldridge Colby as a, as a good read on Taiwan yeah. and, and, and Taiwan defending itself. Mm -hmm. um, I've got to, before you and I finish, I've got to go to, um, you are an incredibly well-read man. And I'm always fascinated whenever I listen to you talk about just the breadth of what you've read. And obviously you're also a prolific writer. Your two sort of, if you will, favorite books that you read almost annually are Old Man in the Sea and To Kill a Mockingbird. Talk for a moment, Jim, about why those two books are so important to you. Yeah, I, I love those books and everyone has read them. That's one thing I like about it. I feel like I'm part of a, a larger community in the world. Um, it's a book that most people read when they're 13, 14, maybe 15 years old. Number two, the themes are so powerful. The story of Santiago, the fisherman, is one of resilience, of overcoming, of knowing that you can be destroyed but not defeated as long as you continue to believe in yourself and believe in your craft. It's a book about mentorship that goes both ways, Santiago to a very young fisherman and ultimately back from that young fisherman to Santiago. It's a beautifully realized book. You can read it in a couple of hours. I pick it up yeah, about once every year or so, mostly for that inspiration of leadership. To Kill a Mockingbird, a completely different book set in the 1930s in the deep South, a story of racial injustice, of a black man falsely accused of a rape of a courageous lawyer, Atticus Finch, who believes in the case and takes it knowing it will cost him enormously his position in society and that it'll bring real risk to his children, his daughter, Scout. And finally, it's a book about a young woman's coming of age. Um, so those are pretty powerful themes that we see rattling around in, in the United States in this moment. So yeah, those are a couple of books I often pick up and go back and read. Can I give you a book I just read that's quite good about a lot of what we're talking about? It's called Chip Wars, like microchips, Chip yep. Wars by Chris Miller, Dr. Chris Miller. He was on my faculty when I was dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, deep Russian expert, deep technology expert. He's like, 32 years old, brilliant. And uh, the book is really quite good about how microchips are going to be a big part of this back and forth among the great powers. So two final things. Um, the first is that if anybody listening to this webcast sees you wearing your letter jacket from Annapolis, um, it has special meaning beyond just the fact that you were a tennis and squash star at the Naval Academy, but it was the only thing that survived 9-11 in your office, um, which I thought was 
super interesting hearing that. And then also the incredible significance that that must have to you, not only harboring back to your days at Annapolis and how much fun you had playing intercollegiate sports, but that it's the one thing that survived that, that, yeah. that, that terrible day. Um, the other is that you've won 50 medals in your active uh, military career. Which is the most meaningful, Jim? Uh, I think in the long throw of my life, the thing that's most meaningful has to do with those medals, but it might surprise you as follows. I, I have been awarded 50 military decorations, 28 of them, more than half are from foreign nations. And I think that as I look at my life, the fact that I've been able to engage in the international world to such a degree has been central to who I am. You know, a long career in the military, commander of NATO, but then five years as Dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. It's a school of international relations. And now my role as vice chairman, global affairs at the Carlisle Group. I'm a believer in America's place in the world. I think that's critical in every way. Professionally, that's what means the most to me, the engagement in the international world. Personally, and I say this to you as a triathlete and a, and a star on the ski slopes and, and many other sports, personally, I'm very proud of sports and fitness and having a racket in my hand a couple of times a week, even at my advanced age, uh, is a big part of me. So they're both important, one professionally and one personally, I suppose. And of course, having your two wonderful daughters and their spouses and seeing them in their careers. Yeah. Um, Admiral, it's just every time I'm with you, every time I read and listen to you, it's just a it's a real honor. You are a you are a true um, not only an asset, but you're just a blessing to our nation. Um, and your career is something that uh, many, many of us are exceedingly thankful for. And uh, I'm thankful for the friendship and extremely thankful that you took the time to share your thoughts with me this morning. My total pleasure. And I'll simply return the compliment and say what you have accomplished in building up this, um, this firm from a, a small family office to a global powerhouse. And think of all the jobs you've created, the lives you've touched, everything you've done with your children, with your family, I had a chance to meet your parents. Um, it's equally inspirational. So thanks for a wonderful conversation today, Willie. And I'll see you in Sun Valley this summer, if not before. I look forward to it. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Have a great day. And thanks again, Admiral. It was a real pleasure. My honor. Bye-bye.